the primeval forest from the introduction of evangeline by henry wadsworth longfellow from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama the primeval forest from evangeline introduction this is the forest primeval the murmuring pines and the hemlocks bearded with moss and in garments green indistinct in the twilight stand like druids of eld with voices sad and prophetic stand like harpers hoar with beards that rest on their bosoms loud from its rocky caverns the deep-voiced neighboring ocean speaks and in accents disconsolate answers the wail of the forest this is the forest primeval but where are the hearts that beneath it leaped like the roe when he hears in the woodland the voice of the huntsman henry wadsworth longfellow end of poem this recording is in the public domain the greenwood tree from as you like it act two scene five by shakespeare from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two song for librivox dot org by lian yao the greenwood tree under the greenwood tree who loves to lie with me and in his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat come hither come hither come hither who shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather who doth ambition shun and loves to live in the sun seeking the food he eats and pleased with what he gets come hither come hither come hither who shall he see no enemy but winter and End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wind and the Pine Tree From Edwin the Fair By Sir Henry Taylor From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The Wind and the Pine Tree the tale was this the wind when first he rose and went abroad through the waste region felt himself at fault wanting a voice and suddenly to earth descended with a wafture and a swoop where wandering volatile from kind to kind he wooed the several trees to give him one first he besought the ash the voice she lent fitfully with a free and lasting change flung here and there its sad uncertainties the aspen next a fluttered frivolous twitter was her sole tribute from the willow came so long as dainty summer dressed her out a whispering sweetness but her winter note was hissing dry and reedy lastly the pine did he solicit and from her he drew a voice so constant soft and lowly deep that there he rested welcoming in her a mild memorial of the ocean cave where he was born end of poem this recording is in the public domain the brave old oak by Henry Fothergill Chorley, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Brave Old Oak. 
a song to the oak the brave old oak who hath ruled in the green wood long he has health and renown to his broad green crown and his fifty arms so strong there's fear in his frown when the sun goes down and the fire in the west fades out and he showeth his might on a wild midnight when the storm through his branches shout then here's to the oak the brave old oak who stands in his pride alone and still flourish he a hale green tree when a hundred years are gone in the days of old when the spring with cold had brightened his branches gray through the grass at his feet crab maiden sweet to gather the dew of may and on that day to their ebeg gay they frolicked with lovesome swains they are gone they are dead in the churchyard late but the tree it still remains then here's to the oak the brave old oak who stands in his pride alone and still flourish he a hale green tree when a hundred years are gone he saw there are times when the christmas chimes were a merry sound to hear when the squire's wide hall and the cottage small were filled with good english cheer now gold hath the sway we all obey and a ruthless king is he but he ne'er shall send our ancient friend to be tossed on the stormy sea then here's to the oak the brave old oak who stands in his pride alone and still flourish he a hale green tree when a hundred years are gone end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Holly Tree by Robert Southey From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The Holly Tree O oh, reader, hast thou ever stood to see the holly tree? The eye that contemplates it well perceives its glossy leaves, ordered by an intelligence so wise, as might confound the atheist's sophistries. Below a circling fence, its leaves are seen wrinkled and keen. No grazing cattle, though their prickly round can reach to wound. But as they grow where nothing is to fear, smooth and unarmed the pointless leaves appear. I love to view these things with curious eyes and moral eyes, and in this wisdom of the holly tree can emblem see wherewith perchance to make a pleasant rhyme one which may profit in the after time thus though abroad perchance i might appear harsh and austere to those who on my leisure would intrude reserved and rude gentle at home amid my friends i'd be like the high leaves upon the holly tree and should my youth as youth is apt i know some harshness show all vain asperities i day by day would wear away till the smooth temper of my age should be like the high leaves upon the holly tree and as when all the summer trees are seen so bright and green the holly leaves their fadeless hues display less bright than they but when the bare and wintry woods we see what then so cheerful as the holly tree so serious should my youth appear among the thoughtless throng so would i seem amid the young and gay more grave than they that in my age as cheerful i might be as the green winter of the holly tree end of poe this recording is in the public domain A Forest Hymn by William Cullen Bryant From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin A Forest Hymn 
The groves were God's first temples, ere man learned to hew the shaft and lay the architrave, and spread the roof above them, ere he framed the lofty vault to gather and roll back the sound of anthemus in the darkling wood. Amidst the cool and silence, he knelt down and offered to the mightiest solemn thanks and supplication for his simple heart might not resist the sacred influences which from the stilly twilight of the place and from the gray old trunks that high in heaven mingled their mossy boughs and from the sound of the invisible breath that swayed at once all their green tops stole over him and bowed his spirit with the thought of boundless power and inaccessible majesty ah why should we in the world's riper years neglect god's ancient sanctuaries and adore only among the crowd and under roofs that our frail hands have raised let me at least here in the shadow of this aged wood offer one hymn thrice happy if it find acceptance in his ear father thy hand hath reared these venerable columns thou didst weave this verdant roof thou didst look down upon the naked earth and forthwith rose all these fair ranks of trees they in the sun budded and shook their green leaves in thy breeze and shot towards heaven the century living crow whose birth was in their tops grew old and died among their branches till at last they stood as now they stand massy and tall and dark fit shrine for humble worshipper to hold communion with his maker these dim vaults these winding aisles of human pomp or pride report not no fantastic carvings show the boasts of our vain race to change the form of thy fair works but thou art here thou fillest the solitude thou art in the soft winds that run along the summit of these trees in music thou art in the cooler breath that from the inmost darkness of the place comes scarcely felt the barky trunks the ground the fresh moist ground are all instinct with thee here is continual worship nature here in the tranquillity that thou dost love enjoys thy presence noiselessly around from perch to perch the solitary bird passes and yon clear spring that midst its herbs wells softly forth and wandering steeps the roots of half the mighty forest tells no tales of all the good it does thou hast not left thyself without a witness in these shades of thy perfections grandeur strength and grace are here to speak of thee this mighty oak by whose immovable stem i stand and seem almost annihilated not a prince in all that proud old world beyond the deep air wore his crown as loftily as he wears the green coronal of leaves with which thy hand has graced him nestled at his root is beauty such as blooms not in the glare of the broad sun that delicate forest flower with scented breath and looks so like a smile seems as it issues from the shapeless mould an emanation of the indwelling life a visible token of the upholding love that are the soul of this wide universe my heart is awed within me when i think of the great miracle that still goes on in silence round me the perpetual work of thy creation finished yet renewed for ever written on thy works i read the lesson of thy own eternity lo all grow old and die but see again how on the faltering footsteps of decay youth presses ever gay and beautiful youth in all its beautiful forms these lofty trees wave not less proudly that their ancestors moulder beneath them oh there is not lost one of earth's charms upon her bosom yet after the flight of untold centuries the freshness of her far beginning lies and yet shall lie life mocks the idle hate of his arch-enemy death yea seats himself upon the tyrant's throne 
the sepulchre and of the triumphs of his ghastly foe makes his own nourishment for he came forth from thine own bosom and shall have no end there have been holy men who hid themselves deep in the woody wilderness and gave their lives to thought and prayer till they outlived the generations born with them nor seemed less aged than the hoary trees and rocks around them and there have been holy men who deemed it were not well to pass life thus but let me often to these solitudes retire and in thy presence reassure my feeble virtue hear its enemies the passions at thy plane of footsteps shrink and tremble and are still o god when thou dost scare the world with tempests set on fire the heavens with falling thunderbolts or fill with all the waters of the firmament the swift dark whirlwind that uproots the woods and drowns the villages when at thy call uprises the great deep and throws himself upon the continent and overwhelms its cities who forgets not at the sight of these tremendous tokens of thy power his pride and lays his strifes and follies by o oh, from these sterner aspects of thy face spare me and mine nor let us need the wrath of the mad unchained elements to teach who rules them be it ours to meditate in these calm shades thy milder majesty and to the beautiful order of thy works learn to conform the order of our lives end of poem this recording is in the public domain the arab to the palm by bayard taylor from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama the arab to the palm next to thee o fair gazelle o bedoe girl beloved so well next to the fearless nedjidi whose fleetness shall bear me again to thee next to ye both i love the palm with his leaves of beauty his fruit of balm next to ye both i love the tree whose fluttering shadow wraps us three with love and silence and mystery our tribe is many our poets vie with any under the arab sky yet none can sing of the palm but i the marble minarets that begem cairo's citadel diadem are not so light as his slender stem he lifts his leaves in the sunbeam's glance as the almes lift their arms in dance a slumberous motion a passionate sign that works in the cells of the blood like wine full of passion and sorrow is he dreaming where the beloved may be and when the warm south winds arise he breathes his longing in fervid sighs quickening odors kisses of balm that drop in the lap of his chosen palm the sun may flame and the sands may stir but the breath of his passion reaches her o oh, tree of love by that love of thine teach me how i shall soften mine give me the secret of the sun whereby the wood is ever won if i were a king o stately tree a likeness glorious as might be in the court of my palace i'd build for thee with a shaft of silver burnished bright and leaves of beryl and malachite with spikes of golden bloom ablaze and fruits of topaz and chrysoprase and there are the poets in thy praise should night and morning frame new lays new measures sung to tunes divine but none o palm should equal mine bayard taylor end of poem this recording is in the public domain the palm tree by john greenleaf whittier from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator and Craig Franklin as the master. The Palm Tree Is it the palm, 
the cocoa palm on the indian sea by the isles of balm or is it a ship in the breezeless calm a ship whose keel is of palm beneath whose ribs of palm have a palm bark sheath and a rudder of palm it steereth with branches of palm arc its spars and rails fibres of palm arc its woven sails and the rope is of palm that idly trails what does the good ship bear so well the cocoa nut with its stony shell and the milky sap of its inner cell what are its jars so smooth and fine but hollowed nuts filled with oil and wine and the cabbage that ripens wider the line who smokes his nargile cool and calm the master whose cunning and skill could charm cargo and ship from the bounteous palm in the cabin he sits on a palm mat soft from a beaker of palm his drink is quaffed and the palm thatch shields from the sun aloft his dress is woven of palmy strands and he holds a palm leaf scroll in his hands traced with the prophet's wise commands the turban folded about his head was daintily wrought of the palm leaf braid and the fan that cools him of palm was made of threads of palm was the carpet spun whereon he kneels when the day is done and the foreheads of islam are bowed as one to him the palm is a gift divine wherein all uses of men combine house and raiment and food and wine and in the hour of his great release his need of the palm shall only cease with the shroud wherein he lieth in peace allah ilallah he sings his psalm on the indian sea by the isles of balm thanks to allah who gives the palm end of poem this recording is in the public domain the grape vine swing by william gilmore sims from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin the grape vine swing lithe and long as the serpent train springing and clinging from tree to tree now darting upward now down again with a twist and a twirl that are strange to see never took serpent a deadlier hold never the cougar a wilder spring strangling the oak with the boa's fold spanning the beech with the condor's wing yet no foe that we fear to seek the boy leaps wild to thy rude embrace thy bulging arms bear a softer cheek as ever on lover's breast found place o oh, thy waving train is a playful hold thou shalt never to lighter grass persuade while a maiden sits in thy drooping fold and swings and sings in the noonday shade o giant strange of our southern woods i dream of thee still in the well-known spot though our vessel strains or the ocean floods and the northern forest beholds thee not i think of thee still with a sweet regret as the cordage yields to my playful grasp dost thou spring and cling in our woodland yet dost the maiden still swing in thy giant clasp End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Planting of the Apple Tree by William Cullen Bryant From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter as the narrator Lian Yao as the children and Craig Franklin as the grey-haired man. The Planting of the Apple Tree Come, let us plant the apple tree. Cleave the tough green sward with the spade. Wide let its hollow bed be made. There gently lay the roots, and there sift the dark mould with kindly care, and press it o'er them tenderly, as round the sleeping infant's feet we softly fold the cradle-sheet so plant we the apple tree what plant we in this apple tree buds 
which the breath of summer days shall lengthen into leafy sprays boughs where the thrush with crimson breast shall haunt and sing and hide her nest we plant upon the sunny lea a shadow for the noontide hour a shelter from the summer shower when we plant the apple tree what plant we in this apple tree sweets for a hundred flowery springs to load the may wind's restless wings when from the orchard row he pours its fragrance through our open doors a world of blossoms for the bee flowers for the sick girl's silent room for the glad infant sprigs of bloom we plant with the apple tree what plant we in this apple tree fruits that shall swell in sunny june and redden in the august noon and drop when gentle airs come by that fan the blue september sky while children come with cries of glee and seek them where the fragrant grass betrays their bed to those who pass at the foot of the apple tree and when above this apple tree the winter stars are quivering bright and winds go howling through the night girls whose young eyes o'erflow with mirth shall peel its fruit by cottage hearth and guests in prouder homes shall see heaped with a grape of cintra's vine and golden orange of the line the fruit of the apple tree the fruitage of this apple tree winds and our flag of stripe and star shall bear to coasts that lie afar where men shall wonder at the view and ask in what fair groves they grew and sojourners beyond the sea shall think of childhood's careless day and long long hours of summer play in the shade of the apple tree each year shall give this apple tree a broader flush of roseate bloom a deeper maze of verdurous gloom and loosen when the frost clouds lower the crisp brown leaves in thicker shower the years shall come and pass but we shall hear no longer where we lie the summer songs the autumn sigh and the boughs of the apple tree and time shall waste this apple tree oh when its aged branches throw thin shadows on the ground below shall fraud and force and iron will oppress the weak and helpless still what shall the tasks of mercy be amid the toils the strifes the tears of those who live when length of years is wasting this apple tree who planted this old apple tree the children of that distant day thus to some aged man shall say and gazing on its mossy stem the gray-haired man shall answer them a poet of the land was he born in the rude but good old times tis said he made some quaint old rhymes on planting the apple tree end of poem this recording is in the public domain among the redwoods by edward rowland sill from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by sonia among the redwoods farewell to such a world too long i press the crowded pavement with unwilling feet pity makes pride and hate breeds hatefulness and both are poisons in the forest sweet the shade the peace immensity that seems to drown the human life of doubts and dreams far off the massive portals of the wood buttressed with shadow misty blue serene waited my coming speedily i stood where the dun wall rose roofed in plumy green dare one go in glance backward dusk as night each column fringed with sprays of amber light let me along this fallen bowl at rest turn to the cool dim roof my glowing face delicious dark on weary eyelids pressed enormous solitude of silent space but for a low and thunderous ocean sound too far to hear 
felt thrilling through the ground no stir nor call the sacred hush profanes save when from some bare treetop far on high fierce disputations of the clamorous cranes fall muffled as from out the upper sky so still one dreads to wake the dreaming air breaks a twig softly moves the foot with care the hollow dome is green with empty shade struck through with slanted shafts of afternoon aloft a little rift of blue is made where slips a ghost that last night was the moon beside its pearl a sea cloud stays its wing beneath a tilted hawk is balancing the heart feels not in every time and mood what is around it dull as any stone i lay then like a darkening dream the wood grew karnak's temple where i breathed alone in the awed air strange incense and uprose dim monstrous columns in their dread repose the mind not always sees but if there shine a bit of fern lace bending over moss a silky glint that rides a spider line on a trefoil two shadow spears that cross three grasses that toss up their nodding heads with spring and curve like clustered fountain threads suddenly through side windows of the eye deep solitudes where never souls have met vast spaces forest corridors that lie in a mysterious world unpeopled yet because the outward eye was elsewhere caught the awfulness and wonder come unsought if death be but resolving back again into the world's deep soul this is a kind of quiet happy death untouched by pain or sharp reluctance for i feel my mind is interfused with all i hear and see as much a part of all as cloud or tree listen a deep and solemn wind on high the shafts of shining dust shift to and fro the columned trees sway imperceptibly and creak as mighty masts when trade winds blow the cloudy sails are set the earth ship swings along the sea of space to grander things end of poem this recording is in the public domain the voice of the grass by sarah roberts from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter the voice of the grass here i come creeping creeping everywhere by the dusty roadside on the sunny hillside close by the noisy brook in every shady nook i come creeping creeping everywhere here i come creeping smiling everywhere all round the open door where sit the aged poor here where the children play in the bright and merry may i come creeping creeping everywhere here i come creeping creeping everywhere in the noisy city street my pleasant face you'll meet cheering the sick at heart toiling his busy part silently creeping creeping everywhere here i come creeping creeping everywhere you cannot see me coming nor hear my low sweet humming for in the starry night and in the glad morning light i come quietly creeping everywhere 
here i come creeping creeping everywhere more welcome than the flowers in summer's pleasant hours the gentle cow is glad and the merry bird not sad to see me creeping creeping everywhere here i come creeping creeping everywhere when you're numbered with the dead in your still and narrow bed in the happy spring i'll come and deck your silent home creeping silently creeping everywhere here i come creeping creeping everywhere my humble song of praise most joyfully i raise to him at whose command i beautify the land creeping silently creeping everywhere end of poem this recording is in the public domain flowers by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Yan Yao Flowers Spake full well, in language quaint and olden, One who dwelleth by the castled Rhine, When he called the flowers so blue and golden, Stars that in earth's firmament do shine stars they are wherein we read our history as astrologers and seers of eld yet not wrapped about with awful mystery yet the burning stars which they beheld wondrous truths and manifold as wondrous god hath written in those stars above but not less in the bright flowerets under us stands the revelation of his love Bright and glorious is that revelation writ all over this great world of ours, making evident our own creation in these stars of earth, these golden flowers. And the poet, faithful and far-seeing, sees alike in stars and flowers a part of the self-same universal being which is throbbing in his brain and heart. Gorgeous flowerets in the sunlight shining, Blossoms flaunting in the eye of day, Tremulous leaves with soft and silver lining, Buds that open only to decay. Brilliant hopes, all woven in gorgeous tissues, Flaunting gaily in the golden light, Large desires with most uncertain issues, Tender wishes blossoming at night. These and flowers and men are more than seeming, Workings are they of the self-same powers which the poet, in no idle dreaming, seeth in himself, and in the flowers. Everywhere about us are they glowing, some like stars to tell us spring is born, others their blue eyes with tears o'erflowing, stand like a Ruth amid the golden corn. Not alone in spring's armorial bearing, and in summer's green emblazoned field, but in arms of brave old autumn's wearing, in the centre of his brazen shield. Not alone in meadows and green alleys on the mountain top, and by the brink of sequestered pools in woodland valleys, where the slaves of nature stoop to drink. Not alone in her vast dome of glory, not on graves of bird and beast alone, but in old cathedrals, high and hoary, on the tombs of heroes, carved in stone in the cottage of the rudest peasant in ancestral homes whose crumbling towers speaking of the past unto the present tell us of the ancient games of flowers in all places then and in all seasons flowers expand their light and soul-like wings teaching us by most persuasive reasons how akin they are to human things and with childlike credulous affection we behold their tender buds expand emblems of our own great resurrection emblems of the bright and better land
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Use of Flowers by Mary Howitt From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Use of Flowers God might have bade the earth bring forth Enough for great and small The oak tree and the cedar tree Without a flower at all we might have had enough enough for every want of ours for luxury medicine and toil and yet have had no flowers then wherefore wherefore were they made or dyed with rainbow light or fashioned with supremest grace upspringing day and night springing in valleys green and low and on the mountains high and in the silent wilderness where no man passes by our outward life requires them not then wherefore had they birth to minister delight to man to beautify the earth to comfort man to whisper hope whene'er his faith is dim for whoso careth for the flowers will care much more for him end of poem this recording is in the public domain Hymn to the Flowers by Horace Smith From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao as the narrator And Jason in Panama as the lilies Hymn to the Flowers Day stars, that ope your frownless eyes to twinkle From rainbow galaxies of Earth's creation And dewdrops on her lonely altar sprinkle as a libation ye matin worshippers who bending lowly before the uprisen sun god's lidless eye throw from your chalices a sweet and holy incense on high ye bright mosaics that with storied beauty the floor of nature's temple tessellate what numerous emblems of instructive duty your forms create neath cloistered boughs each floral bell that swingeth and tolls its perfume on the passing air makes sabbath in the fields and ever ringeth a call to prayer not to the domes where crumbling arch and column attest the feebleness of mortal hand but to that fain most catholic and solemn which god hath planned to that cathedral boundless as our wonder whose quenchless lambs the sun and moon supply its choir the wings and waves its organ thunder its dome the sky there as in solitude and shade i wander through the green aisles or stretched upon the sod awed by the silence reverently ponder the ways of god your voiceless lips o flowers are living preachers each cup a pulpit every leaf a hook supplying to my fancy numerous teachers from loneliest nook floral apostles that in dewy splendour weep without woe and blush without a crime oh may i deeply learn and ne'er surrender your law sublime thou wert not solomon in all thy glory arrayed the lilies cry in robes like ours how vain your grandeur oh how transitory are human flowers in the sweet-scented pictures heavenly artist with which thou paintest nature's widespread hall what a delightful lesson thou imparted of love to all not useless are ye flowers though made for pleasure blooming o'er field and wave by day and night from every source your sanction bids me treasure harmless delight ephemeral sages what instructors hoary for such a world of thought could furnish scope each fading calyx a memento mori yet fount of hope posthumous glories angel-like collection upraised from seed or bulb interred in earth ye are to me a type of resurrection and second birth were i in churchless solitudes remaining 
far from all voice of teachers and divines my soul would find in flowers of god's ordaining priests sermons shrines end of poem this recording is in the public domain the life of flowers by walter savage landor from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin the life of flowers when hath wind or rain borne hard upon weak plant that wanted me and i however they might bluster round walked off twere most ungrateful for sweet scents are the swift vehicles of still sweeter thoughts a nurse and pillow the dull memory that would let drop without them her best stores they bring me tales of youth and tones of love and tis and ever was my wish and way to let all flowers live freely and all die whene'er their genius bids their souls depart among their kindred in their native place i never plucked the rose the violet's head hath shaken with my breath upon its bank and not reproached me the ever sacred cup of the pure lily hath between my hands felt safe unsoiled nor lost one grain of gold end of poem this recording is in the public domain the early primrose by henry kirk white from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org, by Jason in Panama. The Early Primrose Mild offspring of a dark and sullen sire, whose modest form, so delicately fine, was nursed in whirling storms and cradled in the winds. Thee, when young spring first questioned winter's sway, and dared the sturdy blusterer to the fight, thee on this bank he threw to mark his victory in this low vale the promise of the year serene thou openest to the nipping gale unnoticed and alone thy tender elegance so virtue blooms brought forth amid the storms of chill adversity in some lone walk of life she rears her head obscure and unobserved while every bleaching breeze that on her blows chastens her spotless purity of breast and hardens her to bear serene the ills of life henry kirk white end of poem this recording is in the public domain to daffodils by robert herrick from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. To Daffodils Fairer daffodils, we weep to see you haste away so soon, as yet the early rising sun has not attained his noon. Stay, stay, until the hastening day has run but to the even song, and having prayed together, we will go with you along. We have short time to stay as you we have as short a spring as quick a growth to meet decay as you or anything we die as your hours do and dry away like to the summer's rain or as the pearls of morning's dew never to be found again end of poem this recording is in the public domain Daffodils by William Wordsworth From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Daffodils I wandered lonely as a cloud That floats on high o'er vales and hills When all at once I saw a crowd A host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the milky way 
they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay ten thousand saw i at a glance tossing their heads in sprightly dance the waves beside them danced but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee a poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company i gazed and gazed but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought for oft when on my couch i lie in vacant or in pensive mood they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils end of poem this recording is in the public domain To the Dandelion by James Russell Lowell From the World's Best Poetry Volume 5 Nature Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin To the Dandelion Dear common flower that grows beside the way Fringing the dusty road with harmless gold First pledge of blithesome May Which children pluck and full of pride uphold high-hearted buccaneers o'erjoyed that they an eldorado in the grass have found which not the rich earth's ample round may match in wealth thou art more dear to me than all the prouder summer blooms may be gold such as thine ne'er drew the spanish prow through the primeval hush of indian seas nor wrinkled the lean brow of age to rob the lover's heart of ease tis the spring's largesse which she scatters now to rich and poor alike with lavish hand though most hearts never understand to take it at god's value but pass by the offered wealth with unrewarded eye thou art my tropics and mine italy to look at thee unlocks a warmer clime the eyes thou givest me are in the heart and heed not space or time not in mid-june the golden cuirass bee feels a more summer-like warm ravishment in the white lily's breezy tent his conquered cerebus than i when first from the dark green thy yellow circles burst then think i of deep shadows on the grass of meadows where in sun the cattle graze where as the breezes pass the gleaming rushes lean a thousand ways of leaves that slumber in a cloudy mass or whiten in the wind of waters blue that from the distance sparkle through some woodland gap and of a sky above where one white cloud like a stray lamb doth move my childhood's earliest thoughts are linked with thee the sight of thee calls back the robin's song who from the dark old tree beside the door sang clearly all day long and i secure in childish piety listened as if i had heard an angel sing with news from heaven which he did bring fresh every day to my untainted ears when birds and flowers and i were happy peers how like a prodigal doth nature seem when thou for all thy gold so common art thou teachest me to deem more sacredly of every human heart since each reflects in joy its scanty gleam of heaven and could some wondrous secret show did we but pay the love we owe and with a child's undoubting wisdom look on all these living pages of god's book end of poem this recording is in the public domain Trailing Arbutus by Rose Terry Cook From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Trailing Arbutus Darlings of the forest, blossoming, alone, When earth's grief is sorest, for her jewels gone, Ere the last snowdrift melts, your tender buds have blown. Tinged with colour faintly, like the morning sky or more pale and saintly 
wrapped in leaves ye lie even as children sleep in faith's simplicity there the wild wood robin hymns your solitude and the rain comes sobbing through the budding wood while the low south wind sighs but dare not be more rude were your pure lips fashioned out of air and dew starlight unimpassioned dawn's most tender you and scented by the woods that gathered sweets for you fairest and most lonely from the world apart made for beauty only veiled from nature's heart with such unconscious grace as makes the dream of art were not mortal sorrow an immortal shade then would i to-morrow such a flower be made and live in the dear woods where my lost childhood played End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Woodspurge by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. From the Wild's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. The Woodspurge. The wind flapped loose, the wind was still, shaken out dead from tree and hill. I had walked on at the wind's will. I sat now, for the wind was still. Between my knees my forehead was, my lips drawn in said not, alas! My hair was over in the grass, my naked ears heard the day pass. My eyes, wide open, had the run of some ten weeds to fix upon. Among those few, out of the sun, the woodspurge flowered, three cups in one. From perfect grief there need not be wisdom or even memory. One thing then learned remains to me. The woodspurge has a cup of three. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Rhodora, Lines on Being Asked, Whence is the Flower? by Ralph Waldo Emerson. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. The Rhodora. In May, when sea winds pierced our solitudes, I found the fresh Rodora in the woods, spreading its leafless blooms in a damp nook to please the desert and the sluggish brook. The purple petals fallen in the pool made the black waters with their beauty gay. Here might the red bird come his plumes to cool and court the flower that cheapens his array. Rodora, if the sages ask thee why this charm is wasted on the Martian sky, dear, tell them that if eyes were made for seeing, then beauty is its own excuse for being. Why thou wert there, O rival of the rose? I never thought to ask, I never knew, but in my simple ignorance suppose the same self-power that brought me there brought you. Ralph Waldo Emerson End of Poem this recording is in the public domain. Early June From Thyrsis by Matthew Arnold From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter Early June From Thyrsis So, some tempestuous morn in early June when the year's primal burst of bloom is o'er, Before the roses in the longest day, When garden walks and all the grassy floor With blossoms red and white of fallen may, And chestnut flowers are strewn, So have I heard the cuckoo's parting cry From the wet field, through the vexed garden trees, Come with the volleying rain and tossing breeze. The bloom is gone and with 
the bloom go i too quick despairer wherefore wilt thou go soon will the high midsummer pomps come on soon will the musk carnations break and swell soon shall we have gold-dusted snapdragon sweet william with his homely cottage smell and stalks in fragrant blow roses that down the alleys shine afar and open jasmine muffled lattices and groups under the dreaming garden trees and the full moon and the white evening star end of poem this recording is in the public domain to violets by robert herrick from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama to violets welcome maids of honor you do bring in the spring and wait upon her she has virgins many fresh and fair yet you are more sweet than any y are the maiden posies and so graced to be placed for damask roses yet though thus respected by and by ye do lie poor girls neglected robert herrick end of poem this recording is in the public domain a september violet by robert underwood johnson from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. A September Violet For days the peaks wore hoods of cloud, The slopes were veiled in chilly rain. We said, it is the summer's shroud, And with the brooks we moaned aloud, Will sunshine never come again? At last the west wind brought us one Serene, warm, cloudless crystal day as though september having blown a blast of tempest now had thrown a gauntlet to the favoured may backward to spring our fancies flew and careless of the course of time the bloomy days began anew then as a happy dream comes true or as a poet finds his rhyme half wondered at half unbelieved i found thee friendliest of the flowers then summer's joys came back green leaved and its doomed dead a while reprieved first learned how truly they were ours dear violet did the autumn bring the vernal dreams till thou like me didst climb to thy imagining or was it that the thoughtful spring did come again in search of thee End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wreath by Maliga. Translated from Greek by William N. Harding. From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. The Wreath. Now will I weave white violets, daffodils with myrtle spray, and lily bells that trembling laughter fills, and a sweet crocus gay. With these blue hyacinth and the lover's rose that she may wear, my sun maiden, each scented flower that blows upon her scented hair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Death of the Flowers by William Cullen Bryant From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter The Death of the Flowers The melancholy days are come The saddest of the year Of wailing winds And naked woods and meadows brown and sere 
heaped in the hollows of the grove the autumn leaves lie dead they rustle to the eddying gust and to the rabbit's tread the robin and the wren are flown and from the shrubs the jay and from the wood-top calls the crow through all the gloomy day where are the flowers the fair young flowers that lately sprang and stood in brighter light and softer airs a beauteous sisterhood alas they all are in their graves the gentle race of flowers are lying in their lowly beds with the fair and good of ours the rain is falling where they lie but the cold november rain calls not from out the gloomy earth the lovely ones again the windflower and the violet they perished long ago the briar rose and the orchis died amid the summer glow but on the hill the golden rod and the aster in the wood and the yellow sunflower by the brook in autumn beauty stood till fell the frost from the clear cold heaven as falls the plague on men and the brightness of their smile was gone from upland glade and glen and now when comes the calm mild day as still such days will come to call the squirrel and the bee from out their winter home when the sound of dropping nuts is heard though all the trees are still and twinkle in the smoky light the waters of the rill the south wind searches for the flowers whose fragrance late he bore and sighs to find them in the wood and by the stream no more and then i think of one who in her youthful beauty died the fair meek blossom that grew up and faded by my side in the cold moist earth we laid her when the forests cast the leaf and we wept that one so lovely should have a life so brief yet not unmeet it was that one like that young friend of ours so gentle and so beautiful should perish with the flowers end of poem this recording is in the public domain sunrise a hymn of the marshes by sydney lanier from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for LibriVox.org by sonia sunrise a hymn of the marshes in my sleep i was fain of their fellowship fain of the live oak the marsh and the main the little green leaves would not let me alone in my sleep up breathed from the marshes a message of range and of sweep i have waked i have come my beloved i might not abide i have come ere the dawn o oh beloved my live oaks to hide in your gospeling glooms to be as a lover in heaven the marsh my marsh and the sea my sea tell me sweet burly barked man body tree that mine arms in the dark are embracing dost know from what fount are these tears at thy feet which flow they rise not from reason but deeper inconsequent deeps reason's not one that weeps what logic of greeting lies betwixt dear over beautiful trees and the rain of the eyes o oh, cunning green leaves little masters like as ye gloss all the dull tissue dark with your luminous darks that emboss the vague blackness of night with pattern and plan friendly sisterly sweetheart leaves o oh, rain me down from your darks that contain me wisdoms ye winnow from winds that pain me soft down tremors of sweet within sweet that advise me of more than they bring 
repeat me the wood smell that swiftly but now brought health from the heaven-side bank of the river of death teach me the terms of silence preach me the passion of patience sift me impeach me and there oh there as ye hang with your myriad palms upturned in the air pray me a myriad prayer my gossip the owl is it thou that out of the leaves of the low-hanging bough as i pass to the beach art stirred dumb woods have ye uttered a bird reverend marsh low couched along the sea old chemist wrapped in alchemy distilling silence lo that which our father age had died to know the menstruum that dissolves all matter thou hast found it for this silence filling now the globed clarity of receiving space this solves us all man matter doubt disgrace death love sin sanity must in your silence clear solution lie too clear that crystal nothing who'll peruse the blackest night could bring us brighter news yet precious qualities of silence haunt round these vast margins ministrant oh if thy souls at latter gasp for space with trying to breathe no bigger than thy race just to be fallowed when that thou hast found no man with room or grace enough of bound to entertain that new thou tellest thou art tis here tis here thou canst unhand thy heart and breathe it freely and breathe it free by rangy marsh in lone sea liberty the tides at full the marsh with flooded streams glimmers a limpid labyrinth of dreams each winding creek in grave entrancement lies a rhapsody of morning stars the skies shine scant with one forked galaxy the marsh brags ten looped on his breast they lie oh what if a sound should be made oh what if a bound should be laid to this bow and string tension of beauty and silence a spring to the bend of beauty the bow or the hold of silence the string i fear me i fear me yon dome of diaphanous gleam will break as a bubble overblown in a dream yon dome of two tenuous tissues of space and of night overweighted with stars overfreighted with light oversated with beauty and silence will seem but a bubble that broke in a dream if a bound of degree to this grace be said or a sound or a motion made but no it is made list somewhere mystery where in the leaves in the air in my heart is a motion made tis a motion of dawn like a flicker of shade on shade in the leaves this palpable low multitudinous stirring upwinds through the woods the little ones softly conferring have settled my lords to be looked for so they are still but the air and my heart and the earth are a thrill and look where the wild duck sails around the bend of the river and look where a passionate shiver expectant is bending the blades of the marsh grass in serial shimmers and shades and invisible wings fast fleeting fast fleeting are beating the dark overhead as my heart beats and steady and free is the ebb tide flowing from marsh to sea run home little streams with your lap full of stars and dreams and the sailor is hoisting a peak for list down the inshore curve of the creek how merrily flutters the sail and lo in the east will the east unveil the east is unveiled the east has confessed a flush tis dead tis alive tis dead ere the west was aware of it nay tis abiding tis unwithdrawn have a care sweet heaven tis dawn now a dream of a flame through that dream of a flush is uprolled to the zenith ascending a dome of undazzling gold is builded in shape as a beehive from out of the sea 
the hive is of gold undazzling but oh the bee the star-fed bee the build fire bee of dazzling gold is the great sun bee that shall flash from the hive hole over the sea yet now the dewdrop now the morning gray shall live their little lucid sober day ere with the sun their souls exhale away now in each pettiest personal sphere of dew the summed morn shines completely as in the blue big dewdrop of all heaven with these lit shrines over silver to the furthest sea confines the sacramental marsh one pious plain of worship lies peace to the ante rain of merry morning blissful mother mild minded of naught but peace and of a child not slower than majesty moves for a mean and a measure of motion not faster than dateless olympian leisure might pace with unblown ample garments from pleasure to pleasure the wave's serrate sea-rim sings unjarring unreeling forever revealing 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 edgewise bladewise halfwise wholewise tis done good morrow lord sun with several voice with ascription one the woods and the marsh and the sea and my soul unto thee whence the glittering stream of all morrows doth roll cry good and past good and most heavenly morrow lord sun end of poem this recording is in the public domain the ivy green by charles dickens from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama the ivy green o oh, a dainty plant is the ivy green that creepeth o'er ruins old of right choice food are his meals i ween in his cell so lone and cold the walls must be crumbled the stones decayed to pleasure his dainty whim and the mouldering dust that years have made is a merry meal for him creeping where no life is seen a rare old plant is the ivy green fast he stealeth on though he wears no wings and a staunch old heart has he how closely he twineth how tight he clings to his friend the huge oak tree and slyly he traileth along the ground and his leaves he gently waves and he joyously twines and hugs around the rich mould of dead man's graves creeping where grim death has been a rare old plant is the ivy green whole ages have fled and their works decayed and nations have scattered been but the stout old ivy shall never fade from its hale and hearty green the brave old plant in its lonely days shall fatten upon the past Creeping on where time has been, a rare old plant is the ivy green. Charles Dickens. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mountain Fern by Arthur Gerald Gaden. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia the mountain fern oh the fern the fern the irish hill fern that girds our blue lakes from loch ein to loch urn that waves on our crags like the plume of a king and bends like a nun over clear well and spring the fairy's tall palm tree the heath bird's fresh nest and the couch the red deer deems the sweetest and best with the free winds to fan it and dewdrops to gem oh what can ye match with its beautiful stem from the shrine of st finbar by lone avon bree to the halls of dunluce with its towers by the sea from the hill of nokthu to the wrath of moivor like a chaplet that circles our green island o'er in the bone of the chief by the anchorite cell on the hilltop or greenwood by streamlet or well with a spell on each leaf 
which no mortal can learn oh there never was plant like the irish hill fern oh the fern the fern the irish hill fern that shelters the weary or wild roe or kern through the glens of kilco rose a shout on the gale as the saxons rushed forth in their wrath from the pale with bandog and bloodhound all savage to see to hunt through cloncalla the wild rapery hark a cry from yon dell on the startled ear rings and forth from the wood the young fugitive springs through the copse over the bog and o oh, saints be his guide his fleet step now falters there's blood on his side yet onward he strains climbs the cliff fords the stream and sinks on the hilltop mid bracken leaves green and thick over his brow are the fresh clusters piled and they cover his form as a mother her child and the saxon is baffled they never discern where it shelters and saves him the irish hill fern oh the fern the fern the irish hill fern that pours a wild keen over the hero's grey cairn go hear it at midnight when stars are all out and the wind over the hillside is moaning about with a rustle and stir and a low wailing tone that thrills through the heart with its whispering lone and ponder its meaning when haply you stray where the halls of the stranger in ruin decay with night owls for warders the goshawk for guest and their days of honour by cattle hoof pressed with its foss choked with rushes and spider webs flung over walls where the marchmen their red weapons hung with a curse on their name and a sigh for the hour that tarries so long look what waves on the tower with an omen and sign and an augury stern tis the green flag of time tis the irish hill fern end of poem this recording is in the public domain the maze by william w fostick from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama the maze that precious seed into the furrow cast earliest in springtime crowns the harvest last phoebe carey a song for the plant of my own native west where nature and freedom reside by plenty still crowned and by peace ever blessed to the corn the green corn of her pride in climes of the east has the olive been sung and the grape been the theme of their lays but for thee shall a harp of the backwoods be strung thou bright ever beautiful maize afar in the forest the rude cabins rise and send up their pillars of smoke and the tops of their columns are lost in the skies or the heads of the cloud kissing oak near the skirt of the grove where the sturdy arm swings the axe till the old giant sways and echo repeats every blow as it rings shoots the green and the glorious maize there buds of the buckeye and spring are the first and the willow's gold hair then appears and snowy the cups of the dogwood that burst by the red bud with pink tinted tears and striped the balls which the poppy holds up for the dew and the sun's yellow rays and brown is the pawpaw's shade blossoming cup in the wood near the sun-loving maize when through the dark soil the bright steel of the plough turns the mould from its unbroken bed the ploughman is cheered by the finch on the bough and the blackbird doth follow his tread and idle afar on the landscape descried the deep lowing kine slowly graze and nibbling the grass on the sunny hillside are the sheep hedged away from the maize with springtime and culture in marital array it waves its green broadswords on high and fights with the gale in a fluttering fray and the sunbeams which fall from the sky it strikes its green blades at the zephyrs at noon and at night at the swift flying fays who ride through the darkness the beams of the moon through the spears and the flags of the maize when the summer is fierce still its banners are green each warrior's long beard groweth red 
His emerald bright sword is sharp pointed and keen, and golden his tassel plumed head. As a host of armed knights set a monarch at naught that defy the day god to his gaze, and revived every morn from the battle that's fought, fresh stand the green ranks of the maize. But brown comes the autumn and sear grows the corn, and the woods like a rainbow are dressed. And but for the cock and the noontide horn, old time would be tempted to rest. The humming bee fans off a shower of gold from the mullein's long rod as it sways, and dry grow the leaves which protecting enfold the ears of the well ripened maize. At length, Indian summer, the lovely doth come with its blue frosty nights and days still, when distantly clear sounds the waterfall's hum and the sun smokes ablaze on the hill a dim veil hangs over the landscape and flood and the hills are all mellowed in haze while fall creeping on like a monk neath his hood plucks the thick rustling wealth of the maize and the heavy wains creak to the barns large and grey where the treasure securely we hold housed safe from the tempest dry sheltered away our blessing more precious than gold and long for this manna that springs from the sod shall we gratefully give him the praise the source of all bounty our father and god who sent us from heaven the maize william w fostick end of poem this recording is in the public domain the pumpkin by john greenleaf whittier from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama the pumpkin o oh, greenly and fair in the lands of the sun the vines of the gourd and the rich melon run and the rock and the tree and the cottage enfold with broad leaves all greenness and blossoms all gold like that which o'er nineveh's prophet once grew while he waited to know that his warning was true and longed for the storm cloud and listened in vain for the rush of the whirlwind and red fire rain on the banks of the senil the dark spanish maiden comes up with the fruit of the tangled vine laden and the creole of cuba laughs out to behold through orange leaves shining the broad spheres of gold yet with dearer delight from his home in the north on the fields of his harvest the yankee looks forth where crook necks are coiling and yellow fruit shines and the sun of september melts down on his vines ah on thanksgiving day when from east and from west from north and from south come the pilgrim and guest when the gray-haired new englander sees round his board the old broken links of affection restored when the care-wearied man seeks his mother once more and the worn matron smiles where the girl smiled before what moistens the lip and what brightens the eye what calls back the past like the rich pumpkin pie o oh, fruit loved of boyhood the old days recalling when wood grapes were purpling and brown nuts were falling when wild ugly faces we carved in its skin glaring out through the dark with a candle within when we laughed round the corn heap with hearts all in tune our chair a broad pumpkin our lantern the moon telling tales of the fairy who travelled like steam in a pumpkin shell coach with two rats for her team then thanks for thy present none sweeter or better e'er smoked from an oven or circled a platter fairer hands never wrought at a pastry more fine brighter eyes never watched o'er its baking than thine and the prayer which my mouth is too full to express swells my heart that thy shadow may never be less that the days of thy lot may be lengthened below and the fame of thy worth like a pumpkin vine grow and thy life be as sweet and its last sunset sky golden tinted and fair as thy own pumpkin pie john greenleaf whittier end of poem this recording is in the public domain the question by percy bysshe shelley from the world's best poetry volume five 
Nature, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Question One. I dreamed that, as I wandered by the way, bare winter suddenly was changed to spring, and gentle odors led my steps astray mixed with the sound of waters murmuring along a shelving bank of turf which lay under a copse and hardly dared to fling its green arms round the bosom of the stream but kissed it and then fled as thou mightest in dream two there grew pied windflowers and violets daisies those pearled arcturi of the earth the constellated flower that never sets faint oxlips tender bluebells at whose birth the sod scarce heaved and that tall flower that wets like a child half in tenderness and mirth its mother's face with heaven's collected tears when the low wind its playmate's voice it hears three and in the warm hedge grew lush eglantine, green cowbind in the moonlight colored may, and cherry blossoms, and white cups, whose wine was the bright dew, yet drained not by the day, and wild roses, and ivy serpentine, with its dark buds and leaves wandering astray, and flowers azure, black, and streaked with gold fairer than any wakened eyes behold four and nearer to the river's trembling edge there grew broad flag-flowers purple planked with white and starry river buds among the sedge and floating water-lilies broad and bright which lit the oak that overhung the hedge with moonlight beams of their own watery light and bulrushes and reeds of such deep green as soothed the dazzled eye with sober sheen. Five. Methought that of these visionary flowers I made a nosegay bound in such a way that the same hues, which in their natural bowers were mingled or opposed, the like array kept these imprisoned children of the hours within my hand. And then, elate and gay, I hastened to the spot whence I had come, that I might there present it. Oh, to whom? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sassafras by Samuel Minturn Peck From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5 Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Sassafras Fringing cypress forests dim Where the owl makes weird abode, Bending down with spicy limb O'er the old plantation road, Through the swamp and up the hill, Where the dappled byways run, Round the gin-house, by the mill, Floats its incense to the sun. Swift to catch the voice of spring, Soon its tasseled blooms appear, Modest in their blossoming, Breathing balm and waving cheer. Rare the greeting that they send To the fragrant wildwood blooms, Bidding every blossom blend In a chorus of perfumes. On it leans the blackberry vine, With white sprays caressingly, Round its knees the wild peas twine, Beckoning to the yellow bee. Through its boughs the red bird flits Like a living flake of fire, And with love enlightened wits Weaves his nest and tunes his lyre. Oh, where skies are summer kissed, And the drowsy days are long, Neath the sassafras to list To the field hand's mellow song. Or, more sweet than chimes that hang in some old cathedral dome, catch the distant clingle clang of the cowbells tinkling home. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. The Daisy by Geoffrey Chaucer from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Five, Nature, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Daisy, from the Legend of Good Women. Of all the flures in the mede, then love ye most these flures white and rede, such that men call em daisies in our tune. To hem I have so great affection as I said erst when common is the may that in my bed there doeth me no day that I numb up and walking in the mede to seen this floor against the sunnesprede when it uprises early by the morrow that blissful sight softened all my sorrow so glad am i one that i have the presence of it to don it all reverence and ever i love it and ever i like it newer and ever shall till that mine heart to die all swear ye not of this i will not lie my busy ghost that thirst is always newer to see this floor so young so fresh of you constrained me with so greedy desire that in my heart i feel yet the fire that made me rise ere it were day and this was now the first morrow of may with dreadful heart and glad devotion for to be at the resurrection of this flure one that it should unclose again the sun that rose as red as rose and doone on me anon richt i me sette and as i could this fresh floor i grete kneeling alway till it unclosed was upon the small soft sweet the grass that was with flores sweet embrowded all of such sweetness and such odour over all that for to speak of gomme herbe or tree comparison may not i market be for it surmounteth plainly all odorous and of rich beauty of flores and zephyrus and flora gently gave to these flores soft and tenderly his sword the breath and made him for to spread as god and goddess of the flory made in which me thought i mich day by day dwellen alway the jolly month of may withouten sleep withouten meat or drink a doone full softly i gan to sink and leaning on my elbow and my side the long day i showed me for to abide for nothing else and i shall not lay but for to look upon the daisy that well by reason man it call may the daisy or else the eye of the day the empress and flora of flores all i pray to god that fair mort she fall and all that love in flores for her sake end of poem this recording is in the public domain to a mountain daisy by robert burns from the world's best poetry volume 5 nature part 2 read for librivox.org by thomas peter to a mountain daisy on turning one down with the plough in april seventeen eighty six we modest crimson tippet flower those mit me in an evil hour for i moan crush among the stour thy slender stem despair thee now is past my power thou bonny gem alas it's no thy neighbour sweet the bonny lark companion mate bending the mang the dewy wheat with speckled breast when upward springing blithe to greet the purpling east cowled blew the bitter bite in north upon thy early humble birth yet cheerfully thou glinted forth amid the storm scarce reared above the parent earth by tender form the flaunting flowers our gardens yield high sheltering woods and walls moan shield that thou beneath the random build or clod or stain adorns the histy stibble field unseen alone there in thy scanty mantle clad 
thy snowy bosom sunward spread thou lifts thy unassuming head in humble guise but now the share obtears thy bed and lo thou lies such is the fate of artless maid sweet floweret of the rural shade by love's simplicity betrayed and guileless trust till she like thee all soiled is laid low with the dust such is the fate of simple bart on life's rough ocean luckless start unskilful he to note the card of prudent lore till billows rage and gales blow hard and whelm him o'er such fate to suffering worth is given who long with wants and woes is driven by human pride or cunning driven to misery's brink till wrenched of every stay but heaven he ruined sink even thou who mournst the days of fate that fate is thine no distant date stern ruins ploughshare drives elate full on thy bloom till crushed beneath the furrow's weight shall be thy doom end of poem this recording is in the public domain To Blossoms by Robert Herrick From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin To Blossoms Fair pledges of a fruitful tree, why do ye fall so fast? Your date is not so past, but you may stay yet here a while To blush and gently smile and go at last. What? Were you born to be an hour or half's delight, and so to bid good night? Tis pity nature brought ye forth merely to show your worth and lose you quite. But you are lovely leaves where we may read how soon things have their end, though ne'er so brave, and after they have shown their pride, like you a while they glide into the grave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mariposa Lily by Inna Donna Coolbrith From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama The Mariposa Lily Insect or blossom, fragile, fairy thing, poised upon slender tip and quivering to flight a flower of the fields of air a jewelled moth a butterfly with rare and tender tints upon his downy wing a moment resting in our happy sight a flower held captive by a thread so slight its petal wings of broidered gossamer are light as the wind with every wind astir wafting sweet odour faint and exquisite o oh, dainty nursling of the field and sky what fairer thing looks up to heaven's blue and drinks the noontide sun the dawning's dew thou winged bloom thou blossom butterfly in a donna coolbrith end of poem this recording is in the public domain the water lily by john bannister tab from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox.org by craig franklin the water lily whence so fragrant form of light hast thou drifted through the night swan-like to a leafy nest on the restless waves at rest art thou from a snowy zone of a mountain summit blown or the blossom of a dream fashioned in the foamy stream nay methinks the maiden moon when the daylight came too soon fleeting from her bath to hide left her garment in the tide end of poem this recording is in the public domain copa de Oro, california poppy by ina donna coolbrith from the world's best poetry volume five Nature Part Two Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Copa de Oro 
California Poppy. Thy satin vesture, richer is than looms of Orient weave for raiment of her kings. Not dyes of olden tire, not precious things regathered from the long forgotten tombs of buried empires, not the iris plumes that wave upon the tropics' myriad wings. Not all proud Sheba's queenly offerings Could match the golden marvel of thy blooms. For thou art nurtured from the treasure veins of this fair land. Thy golden rootlets sup her sands of gold. Of gold thy petals spun. Her golden glory thou, on hills and plains, Lifting, exultant, every kingly cup, Brimmed with a golden vintage of the sun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Moss Rose by F. W. Krummacher, anonymously translated from the German from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator. Jason in Panama as the angel. And Lian Yao as the rose. The Moss Rose The angel of the flowers one day Beneath a rose tree sleeping lay. That spirit to whose charge tis given To bathe young buds in dews of heaven. Awaking from his light repose, The angel whispered to the rose. O oh, fondest object of my care, Still fairest found where all are fair, For the sweet shade thou givest to me, Ask what thou wilt, tis granted thee. Then, said the rose with deepened glow, On me another grace bestow. The spirit paused in silent thought, What grace was there that flower had not? Twas but a moment, over the rose a veil of moss the angel throws and robed in nature's simplest weed could there a flower that rose exceed end of poem this recording is in the public domain flowers by thomas hood from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Flowers I will not have the mad Clyte, Whose head is turned by the sun. The tulip is a courtly queen, Whom therefore I will shun. The cowslip is a country wench, The violet is a nun. But I will woo the dainty rose, the queen of every one. The pea is but a wanton witch, In too much haste to wed, And clasps her rings on every hand, The wolf's bane I should dread. Nor will I dreary rosemary, That always mourns the dead, But I will woo the dainty rose, With her cheeks of tender red. The lily is all in white, like a saint, and so is no mate for me. And the daisy's cheek is tipped with a blush, She is of such low degree. Jasmine is sweet, and has many loves, And the broom's betrothed to the bee. But I will plight with a dainty rose, For fairest of all is she. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tis the Last Rose of Summer by Thomas Moore From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Tis the Last Rose of Summer From Irish Melodies Tis the last rose of summer Left blooming alone all her lovely companions are faded and gone 
no flower of a kindred no rosebud is nigh to reflect back her blushes or give sigh for sigh i'll not leave thee thou lone one to pine on the stem since the lovely are sleeping go sleep thou with them thus kindly i scatter thy leaves over the bed where thy maids of the garden lie scentless and dead so soon may i follow when friendships decay and from love's shining circle the gems drop away when true hearts lie withered and fond ones are flown oh who would inhabit this bleak world alone end of poem this recording is in the public domain to the fringed gentian by william cullen bryant from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama to the fringed gentian thou blossom bright with autumn dew and colored with the heaven's own blue that openest when the quiet light succeeds the keen and frosty night thou comest not when violets lean o'er wandering brooks and springs unseen or columbines in purple dressed nod o'er the ground bird's hidden nest thou waitest late and comest alone when woods are bare and birds are flown and frosts and shortening days portend the aged year is near his end then doth thy sweet and quiet eye look through its fringes to the sky blue blue as if that sky let fall a flower from its cerulean wall i would that thus when i shall see the hour of death draw near to me hope blossoming within my heart may look to heaven as i depart william cullen bryant end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Sea Poppy by Robert Seymour Bridges From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Sea Poppy A poppy grows upon the shore, Bursts her twin cup in summer late, Her leaves are glaucous green and hoar, Her petals yellow, delicate. Off to her cousins turns her thought, in wonder if they care that she is fed with spray for dew and caught by every gale that sweeps the sea she has no lovers like the red that dances with the noble corn her blossoms on the waves are shed where she sits shivering and forlorn end of poem this recording is in the public domain goldenrod by elaine goodale eastman from the world's best poetry volume five nature part two read for librivox dot org by jason in panama goldenrod when the wayside tangles blaze in the low september sun when the flowers of summer days droop and wither one by one reaching up through bush and briar sumptuous brow and heart of fire flaunting high its wind-rocked plume brave with wealth of native bloom 
Goldenrod. When the meadow, lately shorn, parched, and languid, swoons with pain, when her lifeblood, night and morn, shrinks in every throbbing vein, round her fallen, tarnished urn, leaping watchfires brighter burn, royal arch o'er autumn's gate, bending low with lustrous weight, goldenrod. In the pasture's rude embrace, all o'errun with tangled vines, where the thistle claims its place and the straggling hedge confines, bearing still the sweet impress of unfettered loveliness, in the field and by the wall, binding, clasping, crowning all, goldenrod. Nature lies dishevelled, pale, with her feverish lips apart, day by day the pulses fail, nearer to her bounding heart yet that slackened grasp doth hold store of pure and genuine gold quick thou comest strong and free type of all the wealth to be goldenrod elaine goodale eastman end of poem this recording is in the public domain the first bluebird by james whitcomb riley from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 5, Nature, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The First Bluebird Just rain and snow, and rain again, And dribble, drip, and blow, And snow, and thaw, and slush, And then some more rain and snow. This morning I was most afeard to wake up when, ah, jing, I see the sun shine out and hear the first bluebird of spring. Mother, she'd raise the wind as soon, and then across the orchard come, soft as an angel's wing, a breezy, treesy, beezy hum, too sweet for anything. The winter shroud was rent apart, the sun burst forth in glee, and when that bluebird sung, my heart hopped out of bed with me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.